Okay, so here we are beginning with uh, something that uh, I, I sense there was some sense in the group might not actually work, but that doesn't mean we shouldn't try <laughs> and start with it, and that is achieving a near-term political solution. So let's quickly look at the slides that frame the thing. Um, uh, despite recent successes by the Assad regime, uh, the military conflicts largely stalemated with most experts uh, predicting a protracted war. I personally had a lot of conversations with people in the region who are talking 10 years, not a year or two years, and I think that's an important framework there. Um, and we, we talk here a little bit, and again, you've got these slides in front of you, so I'm not going to go through them in great depth, but that the country is currently divided into multiple zones of control um, with competing factions growing increasingly entrenched. The Syrian government has gained some important ground. Uh, rebel groups uh, themselves uh, splintering into multiple groups have uh, become somewhat more entrenched. Uh, and indeed, the Kurds have become entrenched, and that's become an issue unto itself. Um, next. Uh, so th this is probably the most simplistic slide we have. Uh, because to suggest that we could even draw a breakdown of alliances is an act of great hubris. Um, you know, I've seen analyses of individual battles here where there have been a hundred different combatant groups. Um, this just simply says, the, here are some of the key supporters of the regime, here are some of the key supporters of the rebel groups, here's how it breaks down, uh, here are some unaligned groups uh, that are also extremely important. Uh, you know the key players. We mentioned them in the preceding session. Next. The Assad regime has expressed a willingness to attend Geneva, but holds firm in its unwillingness to relinquish power. Um, and, you know, it, it's talked about a no preconditions approach to the discussion. And, of course, when we turn to them, they will reemphasize that. Uh, Kristen is hurling technology across the room. Uh, there you go. Um, uh, and, uh, and so that's, you know, they're, they're going in uh, position there. Uh, next. Um, the supporters of the regime, Russia seeking a negotiated peace, maintaining uh, a Syrian regime. Uh, now, again, here's a critical question. When we say maintaining the Syrian regime, do we mean maintaining Assad? Or do we mean maintaining a regime that carries forward some of the elements of the Assad regime, and I think that's an important question. Uh, and then there are some regional powers, clearly Iran, obviously then Hezbollah, uh, and Iraq, um, who are uh, also supportive of the Assad regime. Next. Uh, then, of course, there are the forces opposing the Assad regime. Uh, National Coalition and the Islamic Front vie to lead a fragmented rebel groups, while the unaligned Kurdish groups attempt to establish an autonomous uh, region, uh, which is a bit of a replay of what we saw in Iraq. Uh, the National Coalition uh, has agreed to attain, attend Geneva given that humanitarian aid is allowed in, that the end to the government offensive takes place, and that Assad cannot participate in a transitional government. Um, the Islamic Front seeks a new Syrian Islamic State. Uh, again, you can look at these slides as we go forward, but this gives you a sense even at a high level of the fragmentation. Next. Um, and then in terms of supporters of the opposition forces, you have Western powers aiming for a transitional government, uh, which would include an, ascend to, uh, an end to Assad, stabilization of Syria, and preventing further regionalization. And that includes the traditional Western powers. Uh, and then there are regional powers that have diverse interests. Uh, for example, uh, Turks and, and, and the Turks and, and Qatar uh, supporting some factions that are somewhat more uh, inclined toward the uh, Islamic State idea, uh, the Gulf States support, supporting more moderate factions. Next. Um, is that the last of the slides? Okay, so that gives you some brief overview. Uh, 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 and now let's just take five questions uh, to the group and to everybody to just get a sense of where we are. How confident are you that there will be progress at the next round of Geneva talks? Uh, material progress, not uh, sort of papered over progress. Highly confident is A through E, highly not confident. And 
so we're kind of on the negative side of this thing with 80% of people on the highly not confident to not confident end of the, so maybe we can just skip this session. <laughs> Move, <laughs> all right, next. What is the most likely outcome of the Geneva talks? One is no agreement. Uh, B is ceasefire with humanitarian aid. C is a comprehensive peace agreement. Uh, and D is postponed or not attended by critical actors. So, uh, once again, the cheery optimism that you have demonstrated early <laughs> is continuing forward with postponed or not attended by critical actors as the leading candidate with 0% of the people in this room, meaning no one in this room, thinking a comprehensive peace agreement is a possibility. Uh, and then very uh, small, uh, 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 I mean, if you, if you add to this that no agreement uh, is one of the options, you've actually got uh, almost nine out of 10 people thinking this is going to be kind of a futile exercise. Next. Which Syrian group has the most leverage to influence the Geneva talks? The Islamic Front, the National Coalition, the Free Syrian Army, the Syrian Kurds, or the Assad regime? And 80% of you got this answer correct. Uh, <laughs> With, with the Assad regime. Next, which country will wield greater influence in Geneva, or countries, Western powers as a group, A, B, Russia, C, Gulf states, D, Turkey, and E, Iran? We could ask a separate question about when Western powers becomes an oxymoron. Well, look, folks, you know, pay attention to this in terms of the outlook of this group. You have pessimism as point number one. Um, you have no peace process working out. The Assad regime having the most influence. And of the Western powers, Russia having the most influence. I think you can sort of see where the mindset of everybody in this group is heading. Um, is that the last one, or is there one more? One more. Okay, what is the most significant hurdle to negotiations? And if, if you don't think this is one of them, again, I'll ask you uh, what you do think it is. Parties to the conflict believe they can achieve military victory. B, refusal to participate by key parties. C, parties are entrenched in contradictory positions. Or D, there's a lack of consensus among key international players. Which of these is the most significant hurdle to negotiations? Clearly, all of them could be hurdles. So, parties entrenched in contradictory positions um, uh, is just edging out, in your view, parties to the conflict believe they can achieve military victory. Does somebody have another big obstacle that is not on this list that they would like to flag? Any, any, anybody here? Okay, Steve. Complete lack of consensus among the uh, parties to the conflict about the terms of Geneva. So. C, it's a, it's a way of saying C. C Part, in trend, me, yes. Right. Others? Others. Okay, so. Oh, there is. Oh, sure. There's a microphone in front. Another way of saying A is that parties lack a will to compromise. Um, okay. Thank you. So, okay, okay Manon. People benefit from the status quo. Hit, hit the button. People benefit from the status quo. And which people? Regional actors, international actors, local actors, the status quo is, is So beneficial. the status quo is, if you're the Assad regime, it's fine. If you're Russia, it's fine. Yeah. If it's Iran, it's fine. Yeah. If you're the Islamists, it's fine. Yeah. So if basically, you're, if you're, it's only if you're the opposition, this is not so good. Or the civilians. Civilians are screwed. Okay. Um, okay, yes, go ahead. Yeah, I would add uh, perhaps uh, the, the, the lack of uh, U.S. interest or influence on the, on the course of events. 
Well, that's interesting if we think that's a critical factor here. Um, and I think that's something that we ought to that, that we ought to address. Okay, well let's let's talk about this in our role playing perspectives a, a little bit and see what happens as we sort of get into a political process. Um, we, you know, at one point in the drafts of this thing, this this was referred to as Geneva. We sort of took Geneva out because we didn't want to get too hung up in the specifics of what is exactly happening. What we want to talk about is the best possible political process, whether it's Geneva or some other political process like that, we have a framework being brought to it by the United Nations. So somebody here from the United Nations, let us know. Maybe, Esther, you can lead us with that. What is the framework for this political process that we're hoping for going forward so that we can set the parameters? Because then I want to go to the individual actors and say, what's your going in bidding? I would first suggest that you pick up some of the elements that were actually in Geneva 1, which includes elements of a ceasefire, in other words, trying to stop the actual direct uh, violence, which includes the use of heavy weapons and, uh, and uh, other uh, other aspects of the actual military games. It's trying to freeze the military situation, the ceasefire portion of it. Um, it then has some element of the political process has to be in there, and we'll talk in greater detail in a moment about that, but that will have to include something about elections, whether it's the existing 2014 elections or some other process for a selection of the next political leaders and who that is and who gets to say that. That'll have to be another element of it. And there'll have to be... Um, an element that then lays out what will be the roles and types of power sharing in the future, and then what will be the international guarantees for that structure. I think it will be parts of the process, uh, parts of what would be discussed in Geneva, uh, Geneva, if you want to call that, and then um, what would eventually have to end up in, in some form of Security Council resolution at some point in the future, which then codifies the relationship among the outsiders in support of what's agreed by the insiders. Okay. Because this is not because I think they're more important, quite the contrary, but because I think if we go and start with the Syrian actors and the regional actors to this process, uh, it will blow up all the hopes of the international actors. I would like to start with the international actors and what their hopes are, um, because otherwise it's going to seem like it's mooted. So here we have Europe. Are you speaking on behalf of Europe? Sure. Okay, so you're going into the process. What is it that you want out of the process? Um, uh, end to violence and uh, UN legitimacy blessing, some sort of UNSCR. I mean, for the Europeans, the multilateralism piece will be critical. They're going to want Iran included in any sort of dialogue um, that occurs and um, ensure that there's a regional element to it too, you know, that all of the regional actors are, are included in, in the dialogue. Okay, so that's, that's, okay, multilateral process, Iran included in the process. Where's the United States of America? Oh, I've walked by the United States of America. Um, so what do, what do you want out of this? Well, we want Assad to go. Uh, as, as part of a, as a condition uh, of a process, um, the United States policy in the meantime is, to, is containment. Um, and to the question of Iran, perhaps the United States position is eventually maybe. Uh, Iran has not uh, accepted the Geneva principles, which is the position that the public position the United States has right now. But I think that if you look at the United States, its number one priority in the region is the nuclear deal with Iran, and it's, not, it's going to resist the synergy until there's progress on the nuclear front. So, well, wait if, a second. That seems contradictory to me. If its number one priority is the Iran deal, um, and this could help them by giving Iran a bone here, and that's the number. Why, why wouldn't they sort of use this to help get that priority? Advantage? I don't think the politics here, in particular, there perhaps let let you get out. Get there's not enough confidence that the nuclear deal is going to work to begin the, the larger rapprochement that includes cooperation. Uh, so I, I think from a U.S. standpoint, the nuclear deal potentially becomes the confidence-building measure that allows the larger conversation to begin. Go ahead. I just don't think the U.S. wants it to be transactional. I, I don't think they want connective tissue between these two issues. It's better to keep them separate. Now, I'm sure that's true on the surface. What I'm suggesting is that behind the scenes, you know, there's a little give and take. These th it's hard to disconnect these things. It's similarly like the United States' view is 
with regard to the Assad regime as they want them to go. But a year and a half ago, the statements from the United States were much stronger on that than they are today. So there's some sort of, right? Is there some kind of shifting going on? <clears throat> so um, uh, the US does not have a settled opinion. We'll tell you when we do. Uh, <clears throat> we're, uh, uh, we have established a red line that Assad has to go. Uh, but we're beginning to have second thoughts. Red lines in Syria. I wouldn't use that terminology <laughs> if I were you. But I we're beginning <laughs> to have second. We're beginning to have second thoughts about that uh, that red line, uh, and that's in part because we're becoming increasingly worried about the jihadist element um, in Syria, and so um, we're internally we're trying to balance. Uh, what it means um, for the, the region and for our equities within the region. Uh, meanwhile, our Israeli friends are telling us stay away from the Iranians, our Saudi friends are telling us stay away from the Iranians, and we're about, we're trying to facilitate a process that is going to bring the Iranians to the table and potentially bring uh, uh, representatives from Assad to the table. But given the United States is always divided within itself, uh, I, I would say just from a political calculation, there's absolutely no way that the United States can come off of its, its multi, the, uh, of, the, of the strong position from the president on down that Assad has to go, whether inside the discussions of the government that there's a recognition that there's maybe something developing that's worse than Assad. From a political standpoint, this has to be the, the most significant element of U.S. policy. Okay, that's a, st a strong view, and all I can think of is the 14 red lines that were crossed prior to taking no action the last time around. D do you want to make an intervention here? Well, you shouldn't be that deferential to everybody else. I mean, it's just do you, in the in the context of the going in bidding here, though. That's where I want to stay. Okay. <clears throat> So representing international peacekeepers, I, I want to make a distinction between peacekeeping and peace enforcement. You know, the UN has moved, been moving in the direction of peace enforcement. The UN started, um, you know, we, we mentioned the UN having, sending in a UN stabilization force, which has been the de facto solution now um, in the DRC, starting with the language of neutralization of armed actors in the mandate itself in the DRC. Um, I mean, the UN for the first time is, is moving into this territory of peace enforcement. It's been very adept at peace, at peacekeeping, multidimensional peacekeeping, establishing peace once there's a peace accord to establish. The UN is not particularly good at peace enforcement. So we have to decide who is going to be the enforcer, and maybe that wouldn't be the UN. Okay, so we're, but we're a couple of moves away from that. Right now, we're going into a talks. And I just, I'm gonna, just going to take a couple of the outside views, and then I'm going to do the inside views okay, of people who have stakes in this. So let's, let's go to Russia, and then I'm going to go to Iran, Iraq, and Saudi in quick order. So let's do this fairly quickly. You're going in bidding. Right. What do you want out of this? Uh, we, first of all, a, a, a Syrian-led process, uh, as has already been agreed uh, in Geneva the first time. Uh, an end to external support uh, for the, uh, uh, the, the fighting, bearing in mind, of course, that we would uh, exclude our own support as being external support because we're providing support as the Russian government to the legitimate government of, of Syria. So uh, a, an important distinction there. Uh, a strong central government. Uh, that can maintain stability in the country, and that government should have uh, an important role uh, for, uh, for the Alawites. Uh, and uh, if there is some kind of a UN Security Council resolution that codifies all of this, uh, we would not want uh, some kind of military uh, enforcement mechanism from the outside. Okay. 
What about Iran? If, if I can just add just oh. very quickly, you know, I think that the, 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 the chemical weapons agreement has shown that the, you know, the Syrian government has, has complied with this, is a responsible actor, and therefore I think that from, you know, from the Russian point of view, uh, the Syrian government has proved its bona fides, and so we have to go forward through this process, very much including the current Syrian leadership. Okay, what about Iran? Well, recognizing that uh, Iran is probably just as divided as the U.S. is internally over what to do about, uh, about Syria generally, and maybe specifically with regard to these talks, we thought about it in terms of three broad priorities. First, preventing the defeat of the Alawi government and perhaps doing what we can to help the regime through these talks, preventing the West and the Gulf states from helping their proxies in Syria, and then ensuring that Iran remains a key player in Syria as we move forward. Okay. Did, Jim, did you want to provide an Iraqi perspective here? Uh, Bill and I have an Iraqi perspective. Uh, most importantly, no strengthening of the Sunni radicals who present an existential threat to Iraq. Uh, within that context of that, uh, an end to violence, Assad uh, doesn't necessarily have to stay. He's not a friend of Iraq's or of Maliki's, but uh, uh, Again, uh, no strengthening of Sunni radicals. No regional Sunni Shia schism. Uh, not having to choose between Iran and the U.S. And uh, particularly for the Kurds, uh, the Kurdish area is somehow protected and not subject to uh, uh, significant violence and attacks. Okay, Daniel, did you want to add something? On I, consulting with my other colleagues in the Iranian government, such as it is, I, I think we want to emphasize that from the perspective of Rouhani as well as Arif, uh, we represent a, a faction within the government that's, uh, that's identified with pragmatism and is ready to uh, endorse certain kinds of compromises and perhaps a second order uh, acceptable outcome for us would be uh, Assad uh, is not represented himself personally, but there might be uh, a sufficient representation to guarantee that his regime endures in some form or the other. So there is some dissonance within uh, the Iranian uh, position in terms of uh, the different interests in the Iranian government itself. Okay. And in the kingdom? Yes, I think we're, uh, we're very disappointed in the U.S. failure to come to work out a deal with the Russians. And we're certainly very worried about the, an invitation to Iran to a seat at that table. Um, we're frankly concerned the U.S. has not taken a, a more um, leading role to play in this. And um, we're not so worried about the jihadists. In fact, we would really like to see much more uh, effort to build up support among the traditional elite. Okay. Last two international actors before I sort of get inside the borders of the country, Turkey. Can I just add one oh, thing oh, to sure, what he Karen, said? Go ahead. I think Prince Bandar has all of those views, but my personal view is that for Saudi Arabia itself, the regime is much more focused on its its transition and its own internal survival, frankly, than on anything in Syria. Okay. Turkey? Okay. Um, yeah, Turkey's going in position is that um, Assad um, must go because he is an obstacle to peace in Syria. And as the, um, as the perpetrator of so many war crimes, uh, the possibility of him and his inner circle remaining in power is a, would be an insurmountable obstacle to peace. So it must come out of Geneva that he has to go. Uh, our second position is that the critical elements in the Syrian opposition that have support from the people, particularly uh, some of the Muslim Brotherhood elements, must be uh, represented and have a role in governance. Um, third is that the international community must urgently address the humanitarian uh, assistance part of the puzzle in, in Geneva and that all the parties on the ground, but particularly the Syrian regime, need to allow international humanitarian assistance to reach those uh, that need it. Uh, the fourth is that any, um, any agreement must uh, honor the contracts from before the war in order to help resuscitate uh, the Syrian economy. Uh, and finally, the international community needs to uh, address uh, the Kurdish problem and ensure that it is uh, contained and that it doesn't represent a further peace, t a further threat to regional peace and stability. 
Okay, we're going to take one last comment here from Jordan. In the future that they want, they want to be built. Oh, excuse me, Lebanon, Lebanon sorry. The unified sphere. Microphone. And we, we are the country of uh, perhaps the greatest proximity, both in terms of social, political, and also historical terms with Syria. The Although you're also the country with the least influence over the outcome. So. <laughs> <laughs> we, we, that, 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 that is true, but if Lebanon falls apart... <laughs> I assure you it'll be the country of the greatest headache also. Yeah. So, uh, there are a few points that I'd like to make. One is um, radical elements and extremists, uh, Al-Qaeda especially, have began to uh, sow their seeds, if I may say so, in Lebanon. So that's a primary concern for us in any settlements. And we know that all parties of the conflict here have an interest in, in dealing with this issue. But also refugees and the role that that plays in a country like Lebanon, but also throughout the region in destabilizing the political consensus in neighboring countries. So the return of refugees um, and possibly the creation of safe zones on the border areas, perhaps even with, a, with an important role for the United Nations to play there, is a key element. Um, also a regime that is in, at, at peace with all components of Syrian society, but also that does not project force onto its neighbors. We have a, a history of that. And, and most important of all, and the last point I think that encompasses all that, is a Syrian, a, a Saudi-Iranian detente. Because really it is the, the interest, it is the, the Saudi and the Iranian regional confrontation that is playing out in several of these countries, from, from Baghdad to Beirut. Um, and we in Lebanon, um, respect the role of both Saudi Arabia and Iran as important players in the region who have a lot of influence in Lebanon. And we'd like to see both of them come to the table and, and talk things over. Thank okay. you. Okay. That raises, by the way, an important question as we talk about this dynamic, which is there will be some things that are on the table as discussions about Syria, but there will be some things that are essential to that that are actually parallel discussions, which is how do you balance Saudi and Iranian interests, for example, and that kind of thing. Uh, Jordan. Yeah, while we're on weak states, um, uh, but we uh, in Jordan are actually somewhat ambivalent about Assad's survival. Um, we're going to take our cues from the West, uh, mostly from the United States and Saudi Arabia. We're a little concerned because we're on the Security Council and there might be a vote that puts us in a very difficult situation vis-a-vis -vis, uh, our leading patrons, uh, particularly the United States uh, and Saudi Arabia. Um, we want a solution that, um, that doesn't alienate Jordan from its Gulf donors. Um, we don't want any more refugees. Um, in fact, uh, the UN Security Council seat is a good opportunity for us to charge more rent. Um, and we will try and make as much money off this as possible. Um, but uh, you, this should, is, uh, you shouldn't be so faced in your. <laughs> <laughs> um, in addition, um, you know we are concerned about Sunni extremists and terrorism. But like I said, we have we have uh, no dog in this fight other than um, you know some security concerns and refugees. Okay. Do you want to make a quick comment before I go to the? You need you you need this. Okay, very quick though. Because Go back I... to the Iranian situation because it seems to me it's very important. While there's no direct linkage, there is obviously and no formal linkage. There is obviously a uh, political linkage between the two because if uh, the United States is able to get an agreement and get the Congress on board and uh, so forth, that uh, will then affect the interests of a lot of countries, particularly Iran. Iran also will have some constraints because it'll have to balance its desire to get the thing ratified from the United States with its interest in Syria. And the more that uh, the issue uh, becomes ratification, the more they're going to have to hedge in some way about uh, Syria. So these things are in the same with the United States. The Saudis are not going to like it, but the fact is that we will have, uh, be entrapped in a certain way and have our uh, freedom of maneuver limited uh, because we will need to get the votes uh, to be able to have the thing ratified. Okay. okay. All right. So, no. Um, but <laughs> doesn't mean you won't have a chance later um, if you behave. But first of all, I, I want to go and get the rest of this in. So the Assad regime going in bidding for the 
the political process uh, that might take place. Yeah, I'm going to just enunciate some overarching views, and I think Murhoff is more up to date on the particulars. But I think Assad has to be going in feeling very confident right now. He's going to send Mu'allim as foreign minister in a delegation. Uh, he's going to co coordinate closely with the Russians because he knows he can never quite trust the Russians uh, to uh, not throw him overboard at some point if it serves their interests. But he's going to try to keep them as close as possible. And he's feeling very good about the fact that he's got his preferred opposition. He's got the jihadists now as the bogeyman out there. Uh, and uh, therefore, he believes that the West, and particularly the U.S., will eventually come around because uh, they don't want a jihadist regime in Syria any more than Russia. And if he can get Russia to continue to back him, the West is going to have to come around. So he can, he's, he's going to go into this with the idea that uh, the opposition is splintered, they're not going to be able to get their act together if I just let them um, go at it with each other, boycott, etc. I won't have to be the bad guy in all of this. Maybe I'll give allow some humanitarian aid to go into certain areas that I control and the like. Uh, but I'm certainly not going to do anything to compromise the good military position that uh, has been won, and indeed the hardliners uh, within the regime are going to be watching me closely. Uh, to make sure I don't give away anything that they've won on the battlefield with those 40,000 casualties or dead that you've indicated uh, we've suffered up on the board. By the way, I want to congratulate you. I was just in uh, Israel last week, and a very senior official said to me that the Assad regime's um, campaign to communicate to the world that their principal opposition was Al Qaeda was the greatest pre PR triumph of the past couple of decades. They consider this to be a real uh, coup, so well done. I would just go so far to say that much like our Congress chooses their voters more and more, rather than the voters choosing our congressmen, I think Assad has largely engineered the rise of the jihadists. Yeah, well, when you've got 100 opponents, you know, pick the one you want to focus on. Assad is the symbol of Syria's unity and sovereignty. He has shown that he's a responsible leader. He's complied with the Security Council resolution regarding chemical weapons. His regime is fighting, his secular regime is fighting uh, radical uh, Islamists who are out to eliminate minorities, including Christians. Uh, therefore, Assad will lead the talks, the outcome of which will, uh, he will remain as president of Syria. Uh, and you said earlier, behind the scenes, behind the scenes he will uh, allow his delegation to talk and negotiate as long as it takes while in the meantime uh, he makes sure that he can crush this thing militarily inside knowing full well he has the support of Russia, Iran and Hezbollah while uh, the opposition uh, have, uh, has allies that are one foot forward and one foot back. Okay. Gentlemen. The core concern of the SMC is to um, secure the commitments it has received from its principal Western backers to provide the military support that would permit it to establish itself as a meaningful presence among the armed opposition and to enhance its capacity to play the role of the sort of principal interlocutor uh, in um, uh, relations between the international community uh, and the armed opposition on, on the ground. And its principal concern is that continued delays in uh, honoring commitments from the international community threaten to transform the SMC into an increasingly irrelevant uh, actor within the armed opposition uh, and one whose capacity to wield influence either on the ground or at the international level uh, is becoming increasingly compromised. You want to say something, Ashram? Uh, the um, FSA SMC is under considerable constraints. Uh, many of the armed groups that are the most powerful in the country, um, and they vary, uh, do not um, want to go to Geneva. They do not believe in a negotiated outcome. They can't see it. Um, and um, those that um, that, that that do, quote, touch this process come under considerable criticism. 
Um, and uh, so that that really constrains what it what it is that what the SA and the SMC can do. Okay. Anything else? Do you want to say anything else? Does Hezbollah have a going in perspective uh, here? Yes. Besides yes. whatever Iran says. Uh, well, <laughs> uh, uh, first I would say that. Uh, uh, our minister will go to Geneva if he is invited with a very detailed brief of what he can say and what he cannot say. So um, Hezbollah going uh, into these talks will be feeling co is feeling confident that military defeat of the Assad regime is no longer on the table. Uh, Nasrallah has been calling for, uh, since the beginning of the uprising, for a political solution involving the regime and the rebels. So Geneva will come across as a vindication of what he has been predicting all along since the beginning of the uprising. Hezbollah would definitely like to see Iran involved in the talks, sitting at the table, and uh, will uh, be uh, hoping that this takes place. Uh, however, Hezbollah will be fighting on two fronts, continue to be fighting on two fronts. Uh, so while a ceasefire might be uh, 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 desirable, in the interim, Hezbollah would like to make sure, before there is a ceasefire, to secure the Kalamun area, because Yabrud and other parts of Kalamun have been a direct source of car bombs that have targeted Dahi. So they want to make sure that uh, Kalamun is under control of the Syrian regime and of Hezbollah forces before there will be a ceasefire, although they will pay lip service for ceasefire. At the same time, Hezbollah will uh, be uh, looking at these talks through the Lebanese lens, so uh, worried about what's going on inside Lebanon, the growth of the jihadi Salafi uh, groups, but at the same time, Hezbollah still believes to date that the situation in Lebanon with the Sunnis is still manageable, and the death toll that the party is incurring in Syria is still also manageable vis-a-vis -vis its own community. Okay. Islamic may not be invited, but you'll probably have a going in position, so. Yeah, our going in position as the only Armenian jihadist you'll probably ever meet and the commander of the Islamic State in, in Iraq and Syria um, is to say that our, our going in position is there should be no process. We want to smash the table and everybody sitting around it and we will do everything we can to sabotage, scuttle any any potential uh, talks gaining any sort of momentum, in particular by ensuring that armed groups will lose any credibility on the ground if they attempt to participate in these talks. Okay. I want to go to one more actor here before we talk about, you know, the, the, the first meaty issue, which is, you know, what's the political power sharing discussion that we, that we end up having here, or the political process that comes out of this. Um, do, do, do you want to say something in a second? Uh, do you want to say something on behalf of the moderate Arab regimes? Well, I wanted to make a suggestion, or, or you know, to ask the Iranians something, but I'm not sure this is where we do that. Uh, not right now, but in a second, okay? But I want to talk to um, the media here, okay? As we're going into these talks, what is the sort of expectations that are being set? Is it very low, or do you, I mean? It, you know, I just want to get a sense of the stakes in terms of the public eye. In your yeah, I think, I think normally you would say that the media in a case like this would probably play the role of downer, except that the expectations universally are so low, which I think has been demonstrated all too clearly by the votes that everybody took here, uh, that I don't know that it's really going to matter very much. Of course, the media wants to have Geneva because it's just something fun to cover. Uh, but uh, the story at events like that is almost always the story of failure. Uh, and I think uh, it will be enormously difficult for the actors who do choose to engage in this process to be able to construct a narrative uh, that the media would then want to pick up as a positive narrative. So. I think the likeliest thing would be a kind of self-reinforcing uh, process uh, in which an extremely shaky Geneva-like event 
And if you want, you could think about other kind of global conclaves which wind up looking bad, like the climate change uh, uh, conventions and things like that. It would be very hard to construct a narrative out of an event like that, that the media is not going to see as failure and therefore, if anything, reinforce the likely failure. Right. Although I, I think the flip side of this is it's easy for the media to write a story about a process like this. It's hard for it to write a story about anything that's less focused. And so sometimes a little bit more pressure is put on for processes like that simply because they end up being covered and therefore having political consequences. Manal, do you want to talk about the going in bidding of? Yes, OK, go on. Going into Geneva, the Syrian uh, civil society would like everyone to think of three words, uh, humanitarian crisis, the protection, and representation. Uh, the humanitarian crisis is not sustainable, and there needs to be a strong role in parallel to the political process that really responds. Um, civilians are bearing the brunt of conflict on both sides, and there needs to be a solution. Um, that goes into protection. There needs to be specific programs designed for protection. Again, civilians are at the forefront, and on both sides, both the rebel-controlled and the Assad regime, how protection will be an issue. And finally, representation. It's important that the opposition and everyone at Geneva represent the diversity uh, in the Syrian civil society and Syria at large, particularly, again, emphasizing the role of women and the role of minorities being at the decision-making table, not just at the front lines. Okay. So we, we now have everybody's going in position. We've got to get into the discussion themselves and what are the critical issues within the context of that discussion. And, uh, you know, I think Almost certainly the first critical issue, or the one that comes to mind first, is what's the role of the Assad regime going forward, or what is the political process going forward? Um, now, I think we know the position of the Assad regime on that. What's your position? With respect to the SMC, with, the FSA. With respect to the political process within Syria. In other words, you're at the table, you're, you're working the international community, you're trying to get an outcome. What's the outcome you want with regard to the future of the Assad regime? From, and, yes, and, okay, uh, fine, thank you. F from the perspective of the, of the opposition participants in the, in, in the negotiations, I think the first and most significant requirement that would define an acceptable outcome is a demonstrated commitment by the Assad regime to the implementation of the principles that were defined in the Geneva One framework. And my sense is that unless we secure a commitment, unless the opposition and secure, those principles, just because those, principles, of those principles include a uh, transfer of full executive authority to a transitional governing body that would be constituted by the opposition delegations to the talks and the regime delegation to the talks but with each side having veto power over uh, participants from the other side in order to secure a delegation that both felt um, was, was acceptable, met their minimum requirements. Uh, in the event that the Assad regime is prepared to honor that commitment and to transfer full executive authority, my sense is the opposition feels that it will have secured a significant victory and that the foundations will be in place for uh, a meaningful political transition to be negotiated in the course of, a, of, of, of future um, iterations of a Geneva process. Without that core uh, uh, commitment by the Assad regime, uh, my feeling is that the opposition is very likely to conclude that the Geneva framework offers little hope for achieving a negotiated settlement of the conflict. Okay, from the others who are likely to be at the table at such a discussion, in other words, the other international powers and, and, and those with influence on the outcome, is that the going in alternative position to what the Assad regime's position, which is, thank you very much, we'll keep doing what we've been doing? I, I hope, I don't want to speak for you, but that's roughly what your, your position is. Is the U.S. accepting, I mean, are you supporting the position that was just articulated? Yes. Yes. Hi, Steve. Yes. We, we, is Europe supporting the position that was just articulated? Yes. Okay. Um, yes. It's, it's, so, the, in terms of the, the, the major Western powers, 
you're supporting the position. You supporting the position as was just articulated. Okay, you guys are supporting that position as well. That we're moving into a different, uh, uh, you know, it, uh, well as Steve articulated. Yeah, I think this this one of the Saudi goals is to see Assad out. So that would be a first step. Okay. Well. Yet. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> absolutely yet. This is <laughs> this is just absolutely unreasonable uh, altogether. That uh, the uh, you know the the Assad government is the legitimate government. It's cooperating on chemical weapons. It's not promoting terrorism abroad the way others are promoting terrorism in Syria. So no, this is this is a non-starter. We would remind our Russian colleagues that, in fact, the Russian government did accept the principles of the Geneva One framework, and to to withdraw from or, or to retreat from those commitments now raise serious questions about the commitment of Russia to a negotiated settlement of the conflict. Well, it's a question of how one interprets those principles, but certainly what, what you outline in terms of... <laughs> <laughs> the Syrian opposition being able to have a veto power over the Syrian government's delegation. No, that's just not acceptable at all. It is an element of the Geneva One framework. Mutual consent of both sides to participation in the transitional governing body. Mutual consent. Within reason, yes. <laughs> Did, the United States would like to speak and undoubtedly will solve everyone's problems. As we always do. Well, I think I think the, the there's a the one one vehicle that might behind this within the in a in a side room uh, within a, a Geneva process might be whether there's the ability of the United States to convince Russia to convince Assad uh, to announce that he will not run for re-election in 2014, um, which then allows his regime to compete through a transitional process to continue to govern the country. Okay. The side room, we're in a side room. That seems reasonable. He's offering that to you, cup of tea, you're having a nice conversation. How do you feel about that? You know, this would be a major concession for Russia to make, and I think that... That sounds like a yes to me, but well, keep going. What, <laughs> what we'd want to know, what we'd want to know is, you know, how are we going to be compensated for this comp for this concession? In other words, that, that this, you know, we don't have to do anything. We can just continue to do what we're doing. We're not going to change course because you think it's the right thing for us to do. Uh, you know, again, we feel that we have the common goal of preventing the jihadists from coming to power. And so I'm not sure, you know, you're going to have to convince us that convincing Assad to step down will advance that goal. I just can say, what makes, what makes the Russians think they can convince me or convince Assad to step down? I think I could win a free and fair election in the uh, areas I control. Okay. You're, well, I would, wait. You're not in this room just yet. I, just, would, I, I'm uh, gonna, I will invite you into this discussion. David, I would, I would only point out that it is, it is now understood and accepted by all parties that it is not required that Assad step down from his current position as president, commander in chief of the armed forces, and secretary general of the Ba'ath Party, in advance of negotiation. It is required that he transfer his authority, executive authority, to a group um, which is then responsible for managing the negotiation process. Um, but he can he can remain as president. He can keep that title. Okay. No one is demanding otherwise. You're not in the room either. But uh, d d yes, but Secretary Yost is in the room. Go, so go ahead. So I think that <laughs> this conversation thus far raises a process issue for the United States. We had, uh, um, as is now public knowledge, uh, pre-conversations with our Iranian counterparts with respect to the, uh, to the nuclear deal. And um, now the question arises, how much can we cook up in advance of Geneva in bilateral conversations with Iranians, potentially, uh, with Russians, uh, for sure, um, with Saudis, uh, for sure. Um, and that, uh, um, and if we can't pre-cook it, um, 
should we even um, go to Geneva? In other words, as we get into January, uh, do we want to go into a process that is doomed to fail, or do we want to okay, well, revisit it okay. at this point? Well, I agree with you. You're pre-cook it. You know, you're you're now. That's right where we are right now. Is that you're trying to pre-cook this deal, and the initiative was opened up, and there's some discussion about this. We've heard the Iranian, res I mean, the Russian response to this. Is there an Iranian view on this? Uh, you know, would-be deal. Yes. Well, several. Yes. <laughs> Between the two of you, at least three views. But um, so, so, so what? You know, you're hearing this buzz, and who knows? The, the Americans may be having secret back-channel conversations with you about this. What's your view? Well, um, sure. I'll, uh, the uh, responding to are the remarks from Comrade Katz. <laughs> <laughs> Comrade Yost, um, we, uh, we don't insist that there's any formal linkage with the uh, Geneva nuclear talks, but in f point of fact, we want to be uh, cooperative and we want to demonstrate that we are ready to, um, to be uh, helpful on the Geneva uh, front with, with Syria, providing that there is progress on the nuclear negotiations. And um, uh, beyond that, we uh, join... Well, you just, I just want to underscore this. this I, again, I don't want to overimpose my views on this. But it seems to me pretty obvious that you're going to make this point, whether it's explicit or it's not explicit, and you're going to play this for every bit that it's worth. Am I, am I correct? Absolutely. Is there unanimity among the divided Iranian delegation on this point? Uh, and look, we have to start by saying that you know we don't certainly, and probably uh, you know we will have no sense there where the supreme leader is going to come down on this. What guidance he will he will give to uh, the delegation, and even then. Uh, whoever represents the delegation, whoever dominates the delegation, the other side is also going to try to play as hard as they can against whatever the Supreme Leader says. So I think there's a, you know, a, a strong sense that the hardliners may be trying to play against the moderates within the Geneva Syrian talks, play against the nuclear talks. I think they will be as hard over, if not harder over, than the Russians are in terms of no concessions, Assad is winning, we have to help him to win, and everything about Geneva is simply designed to undermine him. But again, there's also this element of they will also be playing against the Americans and they will be playing against their own moderates. And they are having to deal with the upset associated with the attack on their intelligence chief by Sergeant Nicholas Brody in last night's episode of Homeland. Um, <laughs> Oh, sorry. Spoiler, spoiler alert. Spoiler, God. Spoiler alert. Uh, forgive me. Um, but, okay. Um, there's a discussion going on with the Saudis about all of this. Where do you guys come out on this? Well, I'd like to say that first of all, we you know that we always favor consensus. And we do have consensus, even though my colleague, who's not a member of the Al Saud, is a little bit worried about the future. Trust me, we're not. Now, we recognize we're, we're in these private rooms now, yes? Yes. All right, in our private rooms, we recognize that Iran and Russia have certain vested interests in whatever happens in Syria, uh, in terms of who governs. You have interests, you've developed friends you want to protect. We understand that. So let me ask the Russians, since you introduced this first, what do you want, what will it take to have you give up Assad if you could have, say, a say in or know that your interests would be protected, whether those are people or, you know, use of a port, whatever. And we know no, that or, or th possibly a process, a process whereby they could be assured yeah. that there would be a successor regime exactly. with sufficient Alawite components and well, so forth, right? Exactly. And I'm thinking right. of the friends that they've developed, both among the Alawites and others in the important security and, you know, whatever communities. And the same question I would address to my Iranian friends. You've just said Zarif up and down the Gulf, one of, I think it was probably um, Mr. Rouhani's second proposal that not just with the U.S., but improving relations, restoring relations with us and our GCC colleagues, and a good idea. And you know that we've supported your civilian nuclear programs, we want them too, and we understand your concerns about oil and a lot of other issues. So my question to you as well is, what price is Syria 
to you? What price is Assad to you? And is there some way we can find, say, a consensus or a way of bringing this together? Is Assad that important? Is that what we're really arguing over? Okay. So, here's the deal. Okay. Assad, you know, can stay, uh, you know, the, until there's a tr political transition that we've all agreed to. And in that transition, he's going to have to go. But, you know, we're all for democracy. But, you know, how much do we need? So, you know, we'll set up a process whereby you should feel fairly confident that there will be a successor regime that will have a sufficient amount of power and that that successor regime will at least control a sufficiently significant part of the country and the institutional apparatus of that country that your interests, your port, et cetera, will be protected. That's, that's the deal you were going to cut, right? <laughs> well, you know, something like that. How do you feel? How are you? Well, I think the first thing uh, Russia would say is uh, Assad is not ours to, to give up. Uh, okay, and, again, that uh, sounds like you're done, but for, go on. For, for, uh, <laughs> for, for, for the Russian government to, uh, to make that case to Assad, we would lose whatever leverage we have uh, over Assad as soon as we start telling Assad that he needs to go. So uh, I think Russia is not very likely to make that case to Assad uh, in an effective way. Uh, secondly, uh, however, I think the broad parameters of what was outlined by the Saudis and by our moderator is, is basically what Russia uh, is looking for. Okay. Uh, let me just add one addendum. There's been a suggestion of Russia taking Assad. I think highly unlikely. Okay, the, we'll get to that in yeah. a second. We'll get we'll get to that in a, in a second. So, I Iran, meh, you know, what do you think? Uh, well, let's start with uh, the Saudi offer, which of course is always very interesting to us because they're right. We, we certainly do have a price. Uh, guarantee Alawi's safety and power within any kind of a successor regime. We don't know what that means, but we'll let you know when it's good enough for us. Uh, free elections in Bahrain uh, and support <laughs> to Syrian and Iraqi jihadist groups. Stop support for the Hariri network in Lebanon. Should I keep going? No, because you're not going to get any of those things. You get, you're, yes, go on. Well, I mean, from the perspective... This of, is the personal uh, representative of yeah. the Supreme Leader here. Or at least the Rev Guards. We, yeah, the Rev, you yeah. know, where, the, where the Supreme Leader comes down ultimately is not obvious right. on this, in right. this process. But certainly, from the point of view of the uh, uh, Javad Zarif and Rouhani, and their political career, to some extent, is going to be based on resolving these problems, then they know it. So we would... Uh, while trying to, let's say, deal with the pressure from our own colleagues among the Revolutionary Guards, we would be able to, we would consider some sort of compromise formula by which uh, 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 down the road uh, it would be clear that uh, the Alawite regime would survive in one form or the other, but President Assad would step down and, and get out of the way. Okay. Somebody correct me. Can I just I... add one, a Saudi point, which is you're distracting attention away from the Palestinian cause, and that's wrong. Right, good point. We need the Israelis to make peace with the Palestinians on Palestinian terms. I forgot that. Thanks, Chief. And we are, <laughs> and we are ready to accept any solution to the Palestinian-Israeli uh, conflict acceptable to all Palestinians, of course. <laughs> yeah, they're 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 sort of discordant notes to the nature of this exchange, which I'm just going to set aside for a second. I'm sensing, you know, and you guys can, you know, correct me if I'm wrong. But before I go forward correct me. I'm sensing, you know, the, the way the chips are falling here, most of the world would be okay with, or, or could probably strike a deal where you move to political transition, you throw Assad under the bus, you provide some provisions for these folks here, um, and uh, you could at least get to the next stage, which is saying, let's set up elections at a certain point and let's move in that direction. Now, we, we're going to have a problem here because I don't think these guys are going to love this, but what, do, do, is that roughly what you're hearing here? Yeah, the question is whether or not anybody really believes that everybody's going to carry out the agreement that they're suggesting. And, and here it does seem to me that the opposition in, in, in Syria, it, before it goes to Geneva, 
has clearly set out a certain set of conditions. And it may want to see some of that put aside the question of the transfer of uh, executive authority for the moment. But it, there are two other conditions. It, one is that they, in fact, have humanitarian access to their besieged areas because that's what they need in order to, in a sense, keep the faith of their people uh, and stop it seeping away to the jihadi groups. And the second is release of some uh, political prisoners. And if they don't get something, it's going to be very hard because they know that the transfer of executive authority is not going to be done ahead of time. And that's going to be a very nebulous kind of decision that they're not really convinced that uh, is going to happen, even if they see Russia sort of winking about it and the U.S. talking quietly to Iran about it, they're not going to be really convinced that okay, it's going to so happen. Okay, but let's, so let's just take that, okay? There are these other issues. He's, he brought up two, but what if we cut you like a deal? And there's a certain amount of cash that enables you to have a certain amount of humanitarian something or other, and we'll worry about the political prisoner stuff later. You know, I think there's been a lot of discussion about whether one of the potential outcomes of an initial round of Geneva that might then pave the way for a more substantive process is success in a number of confidence-building measures of precisely this kind. One of the critical questions that the opposition faces is whether entering Geneva with all the political risks that entails would, um, uh, would make those those very modest kind of payoffs uh, is sufficient for them to be able to go back to their constituents and say that, that, that the Geneva process is worthwhile. And my feeling is that whatever these side agreements or, 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 or supplemental kinds of, of deals or, 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 or sweeteners might be, uh, might be part of a Geneva conversation, unless there is movement on the critical issues of a meaningful political transition that will lead to uh, a government in which Hafiz al-Assad does not play a role, that's going to be a very hard sell. So what you're saying is that's the most important thing. These other things are nice-to-haves, not need-to-haves. Kristen. I think what you're hearing from, hear from our participants is the classic diplomatic adage, if you have a problem, make it bigger. Uh, and what we're hearing here today is that Syria is not a big enough problem, but we need to deal with the issue of an Iranian-Saudi uh, detente, which would help significantly, and with a U.S.-Iranian detente. Uh, so if, or at least a deal. Or at least a deal. Uh, so if those ca issues can be addressed, uh, what our participants are suggesting is that m it, it may be used to overcome the opposition, both from the Assad regime and from the Syrian opposition, however unjust all the parties in Syria might find that. Okay, Dan, do you want to say something? Yeah, David, I think the way you, you summed it up in your question is exactly right. Uh, a, uh, a deal by outside parties is going to be necessary here, but not sufficient, number one. Number two, given the relative power of the parties going into Geneva, uh, there's going to have to be uh, a deal that uh, will allow a, some form of an Assad regime without Assad to remain in power. Uh, and that's the only way you would then open up the door to a possibility of a ceasefire and the possibility of significant new humanitarian assistance. If that power relationship shifts over the next weeks or months, then you might have more leverage uh, on the part of the United States and Europe to put more pressure on the regime. But the way things stand now, uh, Assad, uh, Hezbollah, Iran, Russia should want Geneva to take place tomorrow, and the United States might want to think about postponing, which is not going to happen. And Paula would like to... If I could just add, I agree with these points uh, that I heard, but I would just add two points. Uh, one is uh, you suggest in the uh, plan about not only uh, you know ways to achieve a more permanent agreement, but an interim. And so the issue is, at least I heard around the table, even with all the diverse viewpoints, there were several common interests, if you look at it. One is the humanitarian. Another is protection, which Manal mentioned, uh, humanitarian protection. And even the issue of representation, although there were different views to be sorted out. Um, so that's one point. And then just the second point is um, uh, the common interest uh, certainly is um, a confirmed ceasefire and also 
having uh, really all humanitarian uh, points addressed. It should be non-political. One second. Yusuf. I, I think this is heading in the right direction in terms of which key players are going to be instrumental in the final outcome. But I think as we discuss who sits in that back room, ultimately the final decision will be, will be made between really three external parties, the United States, Russia, and Saudi. Sad to say, but in reality, I don't think the Assad regime or the opposition will be in that room when that deal is struck. So the question is, between the United States, Russia, and the Saudis, what are you willing to accept and what are you willing to throw out? And I think as we progress, this is, in, in terms of my assessment, this is, I think, where a deal will be made between okay, those well, let's, two Okay, let's deal with one dimension of that deal right now, okay? We're sort of brokering something here. And it's, it's, it's something about a transition to, uh, a, you know, a political power sharing arrangement in which there's a significant role for an Assad regime that doesn't have Assad in it. And, you know, that's been put forth, and certainly the U.S. and the Saudis seem to agree with it, and um, uh, the Russians and the Iranians are willing to do some work on it, okay? So congratulations. The, the Saudis and the United States are not going to have to present this to Assad. You do. So you're now in a room with them. Please explain to them how your continued support um, is contingent on them doing a few subtle changes. Before we do that, could I just indicate, I'm not sure Russia can. I don't think Putin can do this. Um, I think that while, while he signaled that, in fact, he can live without Assad, I don't think Putin can be seen to throw Assad under the bus. Remember, he's got all these allies in Central Asia. If he's seen as being willing to sacrifice Assad, these guys all go over to China. Okay, well, but, how does that happen then? Sorry? You're willing to go along with this deal. You don't want to be yeah. seen as throwing okay. him under the bus. So what do you suggest? There's two two ways, it seems to me, that it's the United States that has to persuade Assad oh, to leave, or, and I'm sorry to say this, something unfortunate has to happen to Assad <laughs> to make it impossible for him to function <laughs> as president. As happened in Yemen. The only reason why we had this deal transferring power in Yemen was because the president became strongly injured. Strongly injured. Yes. Sorry about that. <laughs> Sorry, my English isn't so great. Um, or, or, or let me just add, or somebody uh, in, inside the Assad regime needs to make this case to, uh, to Assad. Okay, well, somebody's got to make this case, and you guys are not. You're copping out. So who is going to make the case on behalf of the Russians? I nominate France. So, um, <laughs> what about Iran? We'll come, back, we'll come back to them. Go on. No, I uh, thank you for uh, bringing us back into the back room. Europe has some hurt feelings and feeling a little left out, uh, but. Um, we, France, uh, feel that uh, we just don't have the leverage. We don't, we don't have the influence over Assad. We shouldn't be the ones to go to him. It's really the Russians that have any potential relationship. I mean, even that, I have to say, Europe doubts the, the influence that the Russians have over Assad. But if in a contest between France and Russia, we'd certainly nominate our friends in Moscow to go deliver the bad news. Okay, and they don't want to deliver the bad news. That only leaves one other potential player. Of course, you've got a few chips in this game, so maybe this could be to your advantage. Are you guys willing to go and cut this deal? Turkey volunteers. Oh, <laughs> Turkey has played such a constructive role in this so far. Um, yeah, yeah. <laughs> go, go, go. Okay, we're having an Iranian internal discussion here. You know, it, it so depends on who is who shows up at the table, which depends on who the leader sends to the table. Um, 
you know, the Rev Guard's position is going to be, and I think it's nicely echoed there, screw the Russians. If they want to cut the deal, let them get uh, Assad out of the power. Uh, take five or six motorized rifle divisions and good luck getting it there. Uh, you know, from the Guard's perspective, we will back Assad. You don't need the Russians. We'll provide you everything that you need. But you know, again, we keep making this point that, that we don't know where the leader is going to be. It is likely that there are going to be two very different perspectives within the Iranian regime on what to do under these circumstances. And at the end of the day, it's going to be the leader's decision. Okay. Look, we got a problem here. You started a process. Con congratulations for that. We're, m we're moving in the direction of the process. We've heard, I think, uh, 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 unvarnished and accurate opinion on the part of Yusuf here that the U.S. or the Saudis or the Russians are really going to be the people with some muscle behind all of this thing. We've already heard that the Saudis care, but they don't care that much. They want to play a constructive role, but they're not going to put their shoulder into it. The Russians are willing to cut the deal, but they don't want to look like they're cutting the deal. Um, so what do you do? Well, we would be willing to offer substantial money to Assad if he wanted to go somewhere. Thank you. Well, I think a couple of things. First, we... How do you feel about that? We'll, uh, we'll, uh, we'll make John Kerry the starting goalie for the Olympic uh, gold medal game against Russia. <laughs> that may help. Um, I, I do like the idea of uh, Saudi Arabia providing uh, medical care to an Assad who's uh, strongly hurt. <laughs> From a U.S. standpoint, um, we, we will go to Geneva valuing a process. Uh, and if that process uh, takes a while to uh, unfold, I think that would be content, you know, for the, that, would be, that would be an acceptable outcome to the United States, that, that the process has started and it will continue, you know, for an indefinite period of time as it uh, ripens along the lines of perhaps uh, a, a nuclear deal where um, uh, some arrangement can be made, uh, a trade of Assad for some detail that's of value to the Iranians that the United States can live with. So I, I, I don't know that we require uh, a, a, an outcome that uh, um, that necessarily has to be uh, resolved in January on January 22nd. Julian or France. Since or we're out of ideas, uh, can no. we call Brahimi and put him right here in this empty seat? <laughs> <laughs> I, I think I would, um, if I were in the U.S. shoes, and they take advice from the SMC all the time, we know, uh, I would encourage those back-channel conversations with the Iranians. I would build on Iranian concerns about the stability of minority-ruled regimes. I would make the case that it is in the mutual interest of Iran and the United States to have a moderate Sunni-led government in Syria with the capacity to participate in the suppression of the jihadists who are the um, principal security threat that both of our governments face. By the way, and, who said anything about a moderate Sunni-led regime in Syria? We haven't even gotten anywhere close to that. One of the contingent components of this deal is that there is a transition and that there is an Assad regime that continues on. This I know this but, is what but you this want. Is a, this is a back-channel conversation which may not be guided necessarily by all of the yeah, understandings. But, they, the, but the Iranians may be perfectly happy to have another government in there, but that it may not actually be a moderate Sunni-led government is what I'm saying. True. This, what? Go ahead. This, th this grows out of some conversations I've had with Iranian foreign ministry officials in which they've indicated this general framework is providing a potential basis for a back-channel deal. Okay, I want to I want to move forward through this. Go, yes, quickly. Well, I mean, first of all, Turkey is seriously injured that you haven't taken this into consideration until now, considering the fact that a Turkey has the longest border, the most. Into, if you look at all the jihadists that are coming through Turkey. And the one, the one place where the Turks can be influential is to talk to the Iranians. I mean, in some ways, the Iranians and the, and the Turks are vying for influence uh, over Syria. And the Iranians are worried that the Turks will take, if Assad falls, that it's going to become a Turkish protectorate, which it will be under a Sunni regime because the Turks have the money, the wherewithal, and everything else. So if you want to send a message to get the, um, to convince the Iranians to, uh, to reduce their um, support for Assad, the Turks might be a the conduit and the Turks may, may make like a deal okay very very quickly Andrew 
and then just one thing very, that I would very add quickly, is that yeah. if we have a deal that meets Iranian interests and, and ours, then we can serve as the conduit to al-Assad. We can both provide the bad news to him, and we can also work with the Iranians to identify possible replacements in a new regime. Okay. No, or the same regime, but new leadership. Uh, okay. Let's come back to that in a second. Esther. I think different parts of the UN Secretariat would actually come in talking to these member states because they're usually serving tea in the back rooms and say, first off, that you're, you, we need to have the humanitarian corridors issue again. So Valerie Amos is going to come up and say, wait a minute, make sure that you're working on the humanitarian side because you're going to come back to the UN on supporting for that. So maybe as part of the Geneva conversation, we can have the humanitarian access issue, including cross-border included. Uh, you will have a uh, the uh, the uh, secretary and, and Ban Ki Moon shop saying, wait a minute, you're all going to come back to the UN and you won't pay for it, so we want to have something you know, put in now about a trust fund to fund all this that you're going to want to do. And then, of course, um, High Commissioner for Human Rights, PLA, will be talking about getting access for the Commission of Inquiry, and probably Ambassador Brahimi will probably come by and say, whatever happened to transi transitional justice, and where is this going to fit into this picture? Again, throwing something on the table that might be a surprise to some of the member states as well. Okay. So here's where you guys are. All this is going on, and you have a sense all this is going on. And so you're now coming in knowing that essentially your biggest supporters are about to throw you under the bus. Or at we least don't know that. We, what you know, okay. What you know, what you're hearing is that they might be willing to throw you under the bus, and that there seems to be a willingness to go to providing some continuity for the Assad regime, but not for Assad. And there may be some cash floating around out there, and there may be some other elements of the deal. Before somebody's actually proffered the deal, what's your view of how to handle the situation? We can only smile at all this. We're a bit nervous, but we smile. Money has been offered, and asylum has been offered early on, and we rejected this. We are confident that our Iranian friends know what a great stake they have in Syria. Not only them, but Hezbollah. It's the most enduring strategic alliance in the Middle East. We don't think the uh, uh, IRGC, the Quds Force, and their leadership uh, would throw us under the bus. We also are confident for the reasons that Professor Katz mo uh, mentioned that Putin is not about to throw Assad under the bus because uh, there is that effect on, on uh, other leaders. However, we are a bit nervous, and we are not born yesterday. We know that there are backroom deals. And so when push comes to shove and the knife is under our throat, we would be willing to consider doing something about uh, the siege, uh, but on the condition that we distribute ourselves the relief that goes into those neighborhoods that are under siege. Otherwise, we will continue smiling. <laughs> Okay, so they're continuing. Smart. Do you, did you have a comment that you wanted to make down here from the constructive? Please don't forget the extremists. We may not be in the front room or the back room, but we are there, and we are a force to contend with. So whilst all of this has been happening, we've captured a few additional border crossings. We've picked off a few members of the SMC to show our displeasure with their participation. Uh, we have recruited, our recruitment continues apace. We have more and more foreign fighters coming and bolstering our ranks, and we have many, many YouTube videos to, uh, to show that. So just to be, be clear, we may not be in the room, but we are very much on the ground. Okay, this is an important point. I I'll come back to it in one second. But this is an important point. The extremists are out there. The only way to deal with the extremists who don't have any interest in a peace deal is by getting some kind of deal inside and getting everybody to isolate them and to try to do what's necessary to contain and weaken them, correct? I mean, is, is there a different view uh, to, 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 you know, towards that? Yeah. The only, deal, the only way to deal with extremists is to empower civil societies, to empower local governance on, uh, within their areas. And that's the only thing that has been able to sort of at least, uh, you know, retard the the, the, the increased influence of extremists. I have to say, that's very optimistic. What I was thinking was <laughs> that the way you deal with extremists is you take away their money and you kill them. 
I, 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 but I could be wrong about that. Let's hear more from civil society. I'm going to have to uh, support my delegate Moaz in terms of it's definitely um, civil society. In the short term, it's a combination of a top-down approach where you you know suffocate the funding and access for for them. But as long as civil society or people on the ground are feeding and providing access, they will always exist. So it needs a combined approach. Otherwise, you're just looking no, at no, no, a short-term solution. No, no, that's fine. But unless they're defunded and def and and they're suffering then you've got a, a problem. Yes. We, we simply do have to note, you, you could have added funding. There's a lot of money coming from our mm -hmm. moderate Arab states, between Kuwait, Saudi Arabia, and other, pouring in from private sectors into that, uh, into that group, the extremist. You want to say something else? Yeah, just the, to, just the to play. The media can't conceivably play a role Just this, to play the devil's advocate in all of this, I think the more that, yes, funding is a great point, Skip, but the more that we are out there showing our, our presence and that we are a force to contend with, I think the more likely it is that the folks, the, the reflexive response will be to bolster the Assad regime that this will increasingly be viewed as a counterterrorism issue the more vocal and visible we are. Okay. Karen, you're nodding your head. I just want to hear one. Yeah, I think she's exactly right. The more the jihadists uh, act on the ground, uh, the more the U.S. resolve weakens to get rid of Assad. You heard the U.S. delegate say that it you know, we can start this process, it can take an eternity, no problem for us. But as Judith said, for us, uh, there is a problem with all of this uh, turmoil. Okay, um, did, what did you wanna say? Briefly though, we're running out of time. Yes, having just returned from the Turkey-Syrian border, on, on my journalistic Get work. closer to them. Yes, having just returned from the Turkey-Syrian border, one other solution to this problem is that Turkey has to be much more engaged than it has so far in stopping the jihadists who are all coming through uh, Rouhani and several other Turkish sites. There's no obstacle to their being able to cross the border into Syria. So the Turks also have to be engaged. George. Yeah, my colleague was prescient when she said earlier that, uh, you know, you're talking about now how we deal with the extremists now that you've got your nice little package deal here, and which involves who goes after the extremists. And this sounds like a movie I've seen before where you strike your deal and then you turn it over to the secretary general and his minions and say, you guys are now not only, you're, you're actually going to go play the role of counter-terrorists and peace enforcers, and you're going to have the responsibility of dealing with the extremists in some military kind of way. I'm getting increasingly uncomfortable with that kind of a scenario. Okay. Very, very, very quickly, because we've got to go around here. Daniel, did you want to just very quickly? Well, from the point of view of Rouhani's government, uh, we believe that uh, the uh, jihadists represent the single most uh, dire threat to the political stability, and we want to do everything we can to work with our colleagues to address that uh, that problem. And we believe that we do not want to throw Assad under the bus. That is incorrect, but we are ready to support a solution that would involve his retirement down the road and the emergence of a power-sharing government in which the, the regime is solidly represented in the final analysis. Okay, quickly, Karina. Just uh, two words. Uh, to reinforce what uh, the colleague has said, said, the elephant in the in the room is also the fact that there are non-state actors that are profiting from uh, this uh, this situation, as they were in Libya, uh, which means basically that uh, uh, it's it, we are only moving the the, the post in in terms of uh, to the next process, particularly those who are who are basically organized crime, those who are um, funding these this, this whole actors and getting strong. The other thing is that the UN is not equipped, particularly the Secretariat in a house divided, to deal with the, some of the consequences of... Uh, okay, but that's not the point where we're at in this thing. We can come to that. But the point we're at is, can one strike a political deal in this situation and you know, we have an X factor here. And the X factor is, and I think, I mean, we're not going to resolve everything, and we know there's not just one scenario. But I think the relevant X factor, and I don't think here anybody has disputed it, is if all of a sudden there were a big uptick in uh, extremist activity, that might help the Assad regime 
in terms of people leaning back away from this deal. If there were not such an uptick in that activity, if it, things stayed a little bit more stable, then what you might have is the ability to strike a deal. And I, and I want to just go and say, you know, I, I want to take this a step further. How much pressure has to be put on the Assad regime to accept, you know, stay in power through the transition, but in the, after the transition, you, you know, the core of your, your brand may remain, but you personally have to leave. What, what, what could tip the balance? Well. Other than being strongly injured or whatever the yeah, terminology. Re remember that Assad learned about the Russians from his father, which is you, you need them, you take their help, but you never trust them. And uh, therefore, he understands that this is a scenario that's out there, although he doesn't believe it's likely to come into play as early as this January meeting. But he understands. Well, we're not in January. We're just in a process All now. Right. And at some point in the process, looming out there is this pressure. And what I want to know, just from the purpose of our discussion, because we're not going to resolve it or play it out, is what is the pressure that could be put on Assad that would make him say, OK, I'll take that deal? OK, right now, I don't think the Russians have, have that. OK, uh, but you're fighting me. What is the okay. pressure? You're, you say yeah. I'm fighting you, but I'm just saying the Russians aren't enough. That's pressure. And I'm saying the Russians don't have the ability to pressure Assad out of power if he believes he has Iran, Hezbollah, and the Alawite community behind him. And he will argue, he will let, he will let the jihadis, he will let the jihadis okay, gain if, territory. And what if, what if Iran is not behind him? Well, if Iran is not behind you, and his, which means his Bala is not behind you, uh, then he would go and consult with, uh, of course, uh, other senior Alawites to, uh, to see if his position was still viable or not. Ted, I'm stepping on your turf, but you said it, support from within the Alawite community. That's the one place that might lead uh, Bashar to have to leave yeah. if he lost the support. Describe how, how does that play out? Well, it, someone has to convince the Alawite community that it is no longer in their vested interest that he remain in power. If they wish to be part of this new government, part of the transition, then they have to make some compromises. And if that is getting rid of Bashar, he will have to go. But it will come from within that community and not, I, I think, from the outside. Has played a usual constructive role no, here. No, no, I'm just getting out of my role and here. Uh, uh, building on what Skip said, but then somebody needs to give guarantees to the Alawite community. Right now, nobody is out there to give those guarantees. Right, but what and the behavior of the jihadis is, is def definitely not reassuring for the okay, Alawite but, but, community. All, all I'm saying, I mean, you know, again, in the context of this kind of process, which is, as, as, uh, as Steve referred to it, as kind of a thought experiment here, what we're trying to do is stress test different elements of this thing, right? And we've gotten to the point where there could be some pressure but one of the things that we've just heard now is you need Russian and Iranian pressure. And then we're saying if you had Russian and Iranian pressure and Hezbollah pressure, and then you pre-cook this a little bit within the Alawite community, saying, look, guys, you face a tough choice. But uh, right then n now you're sort of closer to something that sounds like a deal, right? And I, I think at some point also, you, uh, we have to also distinguish between, we have to give room to the role that Hezbollah can play in also affecting the Iranian decision-making process. Partly is that uh, right now the threshold that Hezbollah is suffer has suffered in Syria is still manageable. But at some point there will be a casualty threshold in, in Syria for Hezbollah that will be hard for them to sustain. And that's when I think that decision will have to be factored in, into the Iranian political calculus. Jim. Very quickly, uh, since um, the, the Emirates ambassador on forward, uh, one of the scenarios we've been looking at is Russia, Saudis, Americans try to cut a deal, and the issue has been uh, Iran, and our Syrian colleagues said, well, look, we can do without Russia if we've got Iran. That only works if Iran has a corridor through Iraq to uh, continue to resupply Syria. As long as there's a de facto alliance between Syria, Iran, and Russia, the Iraqi corridor is not that important because Russia can ensure that the sea lanes remain open, et cetera. But uh, Iran needs 
Iraq if it wants to go alone, if Russia uh, is thinking of cutting a deal with the United States. Okay, Mark. You know, I think the real problem in Syria is that there is no Sunni Nelson Mandela who could reassure the minority <laughs> uh, regime that they're going to survive. But, but getting into Russia, one of the things that strikes me is if, if the threat is the jihadist threat, as Mona seemed to indicate, is definitely still there, how can you convince Russia that that threat is better dealt with without Assad than with Assad. I think that that's, that's the threshold. Now, it strikes me that maybe that can be done, but essentially before that can be done, you have to have some agreement secret between the Syrian defense ministries, Syrian security services, and the so-called moderate opposition. That, that somehow that alliance has to be put together and then you can maybe dispense with Assad. But otherwise, I don't see how they're going to be persuaded that somehow the situation is going to be better off without Assad. Okay, we've got five minutes left okay. here. I, I didn't quite finish my thought, but the, the thing is, I have something called G2, which is Maine's purpose is not to look after what Israel's doing, et cetera. It's to monitor the loyalty of the officer corps and the non-coms. And so I'm looking constantly for that guy who wants to deal with the Americans or the Russians uh, and strike this deal behind my back. And if I find him, I'm going to have him killed right away. He'll, he will be more than severely injured. He will be severely dead. Uh, so, and the other, th the other thing I'm going to be telling my community, I'm willing to go, but do you think you can agree on one, one leader, one policy to speak with a coherent voice? Because we're the only ones who've ever spoken for the last 40 years for the Alawite community. And so I think I can rally the Alawites. Okay, well, let me, I want to throw a curveball in here. We only have four or five minutes left. I want to throw a curveball in here and, and say to you, that's what he's saying. He's now Assad. You're the rest of the regime. You see the handwriting on the wall. There is some pressure. Is that, you know, can we turn you, can we find somebody within your group to throw him under the bus? That's precisely the point I wanted to make, that we are assuming here that the Alawi community is a monolith and that they are all behind Bashar al-Assad. Well, the Alawi community is not a monolith. And they are fragmented, they are clannish, there are some in the opposition, there are others who are sitting on the fence, there are uh, still others who, who, who uh, uh, for them, it's an existential battle for sure. I think it is the Alawi elite that we have to be looking at, the barons, uh, those heads of the striking forces. And I think here the key is Iran. If they see that Iran is going to be um, leaving Assad under the bus, they will jump ship. But who will they jump ship for? They will jump ship, they will defect before it's too late when they sense that Assad, the persona of Assad, the house of Assad is finished. Well, but the flip side of that coin is, say the international community were more clever than it seems to be thus far, but goes to the Iranians and says, look, we know a deal's got to be cut here. The critical issue is getting Assad out of the picture. Pick who you think is your guy in that regime and help us with Hezbollah and some others to start peeling away the underpinnings of support, not one at a time allowing Assad to kill them, but you know to sort of sense that there's a, a tipping point within the core regime. I mean, I that's, that seems to be a critical issue. In these all. are the le leaders of the striking forces. These are the leaders of uh, the divisions with heavy artillery, the Air Force, the intelligence, the Alawi leaders that sustain his power. Okay, very quickly, yeah. Um, I think Morhoff's right. Um, you would have to look at perhaps a non-Assad family, non-Makhlouf, immediate, uh, you know, the immediate uh, ring outside of the core, the, some of the intelligence chiefs and so on as a starting point. But Ambassador Katouf is right. Uh, they're going to be. They're, they're looking for those guys. There's a lot of speculation that um, that actually the assassination attempt in June of 2012 was an attempt to get rid of some of those figures who were bargaining with the international community. But unless you do that, unless you find that group of Alawis with guns and power and political power, you're not going to have. You're right, not but be just able to consistent do with our overall goal here, which is best possible peace. What we're trying to do, and this is the critical issue at this particular phase of the game, we're trying to say, what does it take? Does it take the Russians? No. Does it take the Russians plus the Iranians? Well, that's part of the way. But actually, it takes the Russians plus the Iranians plus some work within the Alawite community and within that regime in order to sort of tip the scale because it's too easy 
for Islamic extremist groups and others to support the case that you need a side, you've got to sort of live with this. Okay, very, very, very quickly, because we're going through all of this. Mona was next. Very quickly. I mean, my sense is, unfortunately, we've been trying for months, years, to peel away these levels of support for the Assad regime with no success. And I, my sense is the situation on the ground only deepens their attachment as a community. I would submit that if you got Russia and Iran together to withdraw support from the regime, that would constitute a key tipping point. And for me, the question is, for both of those parties, at what point is Assad more of a liability than an asset? Does it take Chechen, large Chechen Islamist extremist units operating in northern Syria to scare the Russians to the point where they say, okay, Assad is now a liability for us. This has now become a liability. That, to me, is the question. Because the Russians could easily arrange that if they wanted. Anyway, Ken. Quickly, I just I want to go back to points that Rhonda made and everyone else is making. It is the Alawi community. It is the Alawi elite. I actually think that one of the worst mistakes we've made right from the get-go is this hyper-personalization of Assad. Okay, it is certainly true that you could get rid of Assad and the Alawis could decide to cut a deal. It's also true that they could choose to jettison Assad as a way of getting rid of international pressure and continuing to fight if they do not believe that their security, their safety, the safety of their community will be guaranteed in a future agreement. That's the key. By the way, as I listen to that, and maybe Mark flashes back or Dan or somebody, but I, I remember at the end of the Clinton administration, we were involved in Kosovo and that conflict. The tipping point was bombing the friends of Milosevic. It was making the mess, sending the message to the friends of Milosevic that continued support was hurting them and forcing them to go to him and say, dude, you know, we, 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 you got to cut us a break here. Yeah. Please. That's exactly it. So, I mean, think about our recent history of decapitation. We got rid of Saddam. We got rid of Gaddafi. What has that brought us, really? Um, in other cases where we've left the leader in power, think about Hun Sen in Cambodia, Milosevic in Serbia, and also al-Bashir in Sudan. I mean, there's something to be said, maybe, for having somebody to negotiate with. Okay. Rhonda. Uh, in terms of reassurances to the Alawites, picking, picking up on what Kenneth said, I think also the Syrian opposition is not doing a good job in sending the message to the Alawites, that they are their partners in this country. I mean, when you have seen opposition group, for example, denouncing the listing of Jabhat al-Nusra on uh, the terrorist list, this was interpreted by a lot of the Alawite as Syrian opposition group in their mainstream, st standing by uh, extremists who are, you know, bent on killing and destroying the Alawites, ideologically. Very helpful. Turkey has something to say here. I think from the, from the standpoint of Turkey, there's a certain unreality to a lot of this conversation, even more than generally. Um, the, the, the first instance is, in terms of the Alawite community, it's a certainly a fine analysis that that's, that that's uh, the important element to get rid of Assad. But Turkey had excellent uh, interactions with the Alawite community leading up to this war. And a matter of fact, uh, we were having you know cabinet meetings, essentially, with the Assad regime every week. Um, and we, we went in very hard on that question early in the war and, in fact, found, as, as the Assad regime team told us, that, in fact, there were very few cracks there to exploit. We've been, and we continue to do it, but let's be realistic about what we can achieve on that front. Uh, the second part is about extremists. And, I, and here I think that uh, the idea of a sort of a back channel agreement that can somehow uh, somehow where external actors can get a hold of the extremist problem without uh, a, a strong and early contribution from Turkey is, is the height of unreality. Uh, it's not just our border. We, we, are not, we have not been in the game of allowing extremists into Turkey, but there are a couple of things going on here. <coughs> I mean, it's a serious, excuse me, um, or Turkey. Uh, there, there are a couple of things going on here. First of all, there is a sort of very loose talk about what exactly jihadists are in the international community. And it seems to us from a lot of our allies that the main, uh, the main definition of that term is people we don't like. Uh, and in fact, I think that there is, uh, there would have to be a lot of agreement among the parties as to what exactly do constitute these spoilers. And I think if we really got down into that conversation, we'd find a lot of 
divides, uh, and we'd find, frankly, a lot of Islamophobia. Uh, secondly, um, we, it, one of the reasons why we haven't been able to control this border and why uh, certain extremists do get in is because we, it's very important, and everybody has asked us from a humanitarian standpoint to, make, to keep this border open, and this has been an extremely difficult and generous act on the, on the part of Turkey, and we need much greater cooperation from other countries, especially from Europe and the United States, but, but from everyone if we really want to control this extremism problem. We've reached out time and time again for help on intelligence sharing on this, on this part. And in fact, we have, no, we have very little cooperation. So I think it would need to be, uh, if we really wanted to control this extremism, a strong international coalition with Turkey at its center. Oh, okay. Which is, by the way, a very accurate depiction of the Turkish government's worldview at the moment. That's my role, I believe. Yes, yes, it is. <laughs> um, uh, uh, last comment. Do you have a last comment? No, no. You. I'm not, we're going to sum it up here very quickly in a second. It seems to me that uh, uh, the U.S. has a weak hand. There is a. Uh, a uh, determined Russian support for Assad, I think a determined Iranian for support for Assad. I fear that uh, the deal is going to be the reverse, uh, in which Iran and Russia convince the United States of the need to keep Assad in power. Not going to happen. Who said? You, you, Inshallah. Not, okay. Uh, no, wait a minute. I mean, from a U.S. from a, from a U.S. standpoint, stay, stay, stay in your role here. Uh, I mean, okay. I, I may agree that there's a rising jihadist problem. But I'm going to point back to you and say, you know, the solution to the conflict starts with the removal of Assad, and I'll I'll stand by that until I hear someone tell me. Uh, I mean, the only card I can play is to suggest to Iran um, that I, I I can begin to ide identify more clearly with the congressional view that uh, perhaps a new nuclear deal is not in our immediate interest unless you uh, begin to show some flexibility on, uh, on, uh, on Assad's future. Okay. Let me say a couple of things here before I turn it over. And I don't, you don't all have to respond, just one or two of you. Um, but let, let, me, let, me, let me say a couple of things. One, I think in this discussion of this portion of the scenario, we reveal the strengths and weaknesses of this kind of an approach. The strength is we can go and take an issue, look at it from multiple sides, kick it, stress test it, really get into it and understand it pretty well, understand the dynamics, uh, and have a fairly subtle discussion about it. But on the other hand, we can't deal with every issue. We can't, you know, I mean, this political process would involve many things beyond just the issue of transition and power sharing and so forth. And we haven't gotten any of those things, power sharing formulas or timetables or the other kinds of things. And we can't hope to in the course of an hour and a half. Um, uh, having said that, let's, let's focus on the strengths of the process. There clearly seems to be a core issue, and the core issue is what happens to the Assad regime and can you get to a political transition? And it seems to me in listening to the course of this conversation that you know, we, we didn't find a solution, but we found a couple of paths that seem more likely than other paths, okay? And one of the paths you know, that gets you almost to a solution is requires, you know, essentially you to sort of pull a straight flush. You got to get the Russians, you got to get the Iranians, you've got to get the Alawis, you've got to be able to, uh, you know, have the, uh, the, the the Islamist extremists not upset the apple cart with a lot of behavior. In other words, several different pieces have got to sort of move together all at once in order to get to the point where you can get this guy to say, yes, I'll leave. Uh, and so, this, so that's one possibility. If you could get those things, you could engineer that, you might end up with, you know, PJ's, uh, you know, approach coming through. Now, the other possibility is you don't get those. And that seems to me to be fairly, you know, strong possibility also in this situation. Because you could have the Islamic extremists. The Iranians and the Russians don't particularly see that they want to go on. Every day further, Assad guest stays in office. His hand seems to strengthen, not weaken. The world has sort of pulled away from, you know, wanting him out. He has, you know, framed this in a PR sense. And so you might not actually have, as we talked, work our way to the best possible peace, a, a negotiated political settlement 
be the best possible piece because it's not possible. And so you then have to sort of work in terms of what is possible and how do you end up with an arrangement that is um, uh, stable and peace-like and the best case post that. At least that's what I'm picking up. Um, do you want to offer a couple more conclusions? And by the way, in the dinner tonight, during the follow-up session at the end of the day tomorrow, we'll be able to add nuance and so forth. We're not, this, we're not leaving it to this session to cover everything. We're going to go through these sessions, cover a couple of key points, ask for your input, try to enrich it as we go. So if there's a point you wanted to make or an issue you wanted to address that wasn't addressed, we'll get to that. Kristen. David, you suggested that if there were the kind of royal flush of support for a political solution, the Alawi community, Iran, and Russia, that some kind of settlement would be possible. Rightly or wrongly, I heard something slightly different from our group today. I heard that of those three, two, if, if two of those groups could come together, that that would be enough to pressure for a political settlement. I also heard one other possibility, admittedly remote, but a real wild card, and that would be Iran alone. A deal with Iran alone could be enough to really change the dynamics of the region. That's an important insight. I think I have to go uh, and go back to your royal flush. I think you have to get Russia as part of that deal. Without, without Russia, I don't see it happening. But I also don't see uh, Iran coming along unless Russia is part of that deal. Stephen. I remind you that uh, the Russians were most flexible at a time when they thought Assad was losing. And so then they started saying, well, we don't always have to have to Assad. It could be something else. So that was a, in the, the, at that point, the opposition looked much uh, stronger. And uh, so the, that was very key. I would say on Iran, again, if the nuclear deal goes through, you could see uh, some more possible flexibility on the uh, Iranian side. But if it uh, doesn't go through and the hardliners pre uh, prevail, uh, you're not going to get them to throw Assad under the bus. I uh, I would agree with Kristen. I'd hate to go into a card game assuming that I, I need a straight or royal flush to win. I'd rather carry a fifth ace in my pocket. And what we have here is the Remind possibility... Remind me not to play cards with you, but I... <laughs> what we have here is the possibility of two parallel and mutually reinforcing processes. One is, uh, to add to the ambassador's point, it is a U.S., Russian, Saudi, but I'd add in Iran, back channel that identifies a person or a bunch of people within the regime that we could agree upon. Because you have to know what's going to happen the day after you push Assad out. And your parallel process includes the same parties, but others on issues relating to a ceasefire and regime governance and all the rest. I think those are your aces uh, in your pocket. OK. All right. Thank you very much. Look, this is, an ex as we said, this is an experiment. We're sort of halfway, halfway through the first day of this experiment. I got to say, I'm delighted. You guys are terrific participants. You've made a lot of great contributions. You've played along with the roles. You've been creative. I hope we can take that through the next couple of, of steps of this thing. But this is a really terrific start. And to reward you for that start, uh, the, those nice folks at the US Institute of Peace have actually arranged for there to be food here. Is it up there? It's back here? So there is lunch. Uh, for you here. Enjoy it, but not for too long. Enjoy it for about 45 minutes, okay? So we will be back in here at 1.30. Thank you very, very much for a great start.